All right, so welcome to phase number six. Um, we're here to have a really exciting talk by Sabrina Green, Dr. Sabrina Green, as of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, let me highlight her so you know who I'm talking about. She's spotlit. This is Sabrina. So I met Sabrina through Twitter, I think, um, or some virtual means. And then we finally met in person when she came and was one of our uh, social media assistants for a conference for, I think, the Phage Futures Conference. Was that this year? Can't even remember. Earlier this year. Oh, I think it was, was it last? the last year. Yeah. It's so, been 10 years, it's been 10 years. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> this year is 10 years. <laughs> it was pre-pandemic. Um, so I'm really excited to have her here because on one hand, her research is really fascinating. Um, she studies stage in the gut and uh, well, she just finished studying it and hopefully nothing, it's never over. But um, she's also part of this new initiative at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas um, called Taylor Labs. So Taylor is an acronym and it's for um, if you, well, most of you know about how phages are used in compassionate use treatments and um, so who makes the phages for those treatments and who provides them safely. It used to be and it often is academic labs, but Taylor is a service center that does this. So they cropped up recently and um, Sabrina was one of the co-founders. So she's going to talk about her talk is tailoring phage therapy for the gut and beyond. Um, and let me see what else. I think I've pretty much introduced her sufficiently. She's at Mother of Phage on Twitter. She's super active on there. So yeah, you can always find her. Um, and before, before I get to her talk, just want to have a couple announcements. We'll try to keep this more consistent announcements at the beginning and then we'll remind you at the end. So um, lots of other phage events. Also, I guess you can cancel your spotlight right now if you don't want to be just smiling at everyone. Um, we have phage events that you may have seen. There's all kinds of events these days. So um, the next one after this that we know of that's phage related, me and Jan are going to talk about phage directory and how we're making phages easier and cheaper and faster to work with. And we're creating tools for researchers to help them share their phages, maybe sell their phages, license their phages, um, and keep track of all the work they're doing. And so that's with uh, the Society for Bacteriophage and Research and Therapy um, out of India, and that's on September 3rd. So tune in for that. And then um, Phage Oxford is a conference coming up September 9th to 10th. Um, that one you may have gone in person before and it's virtual this time, but it's like a legit conference, full days, I think. Um, and you can register. I think you can present an abstract. Um, and IVOM is coming up September 17th. So this is uh, the conference that was going to be in Portugal, Viruses of Microbes, this summer. And most of us that we're going to go are probably sad, like we are, to not be in Portugal. But um, it's virtual, so there's going to be six webinars that we're helping, uh, we're co-hosting. And we have a website up for them to show all their awesome lineup of speakers. So the first one is the 17th of September. And um, I do have the speakers up here. I think um, Rob Edwards is one of them, Ruth and Sanda, and there's one more and I'm losing where I have it, but I will bring that in before the end. Um, one more speaker. And then fave seven is September 22nd. And that is uh, Panos Kalatsis, who will be talking about phage and aquaculture. So, and the last thing is a phage directory announcement. So we've been talking about this a lot lately, but if you're interested in um, licensing your phages or sharing them with companies, many people share them for research and therapy, but we're trying to open up the channel that allows you to make them available for commercial use and walking people through and helping um, get through the bureaucracy and come up with some streamlined paths for doing that as a phage lab. So if you're interested in just talking to us for half an hour on Zoom about uh, your thoughts on this, please get in touch with us. We would love to talk to you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina. You may go ahead. Let me share my screen. There's this awkward period where you have to go through this. Yes, it is. Like, <laughs> look and ask if it's possible and, and someone will say yes, I think so. 
<laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk a little bit, like Jessica said, on um, using phage in the gut and a little bit about Taylor. So this is a service center that we developed at Baylor College of Medicine, and we are providing phages for compassionate use care. And if you have a question, you could always um, just say something, but I'm, I'm gonna try to get through this um, and then we can have questions afterwards. So first I wanna introduce you to a superbug that I study. So this is an E. coli, it's extraintestinal pathogenic E. coli. This is the number one cause of adult bacteremia, the number one cause of UTI. This is one of the primary causes of neonatal meningitis. So these severe infections usually lead to um, 80,000 deaths per year and uh, we are actually a reservoir of expect so within our gut we carry these these E. coli and they don't cause intestinal disease they only cause extra intestinal disease and there's a clonal group of this expect it's called ST131 and they are multi-drug resistant and they're linked to the global spread of antibiotic resistance so these strains are colonizing us and we may be potentially spreading antibiotic resistance because of it and there's no vaccine against expect so we are actually working on developing one and other groups are too but currently there's no vaccine that i know of i'm pretty sure there isn't so what our group wanted to know is how do we actually treat and prevent these infections? And for that, we turn to bacteriophages. And um, in case you don't know what bacteriophages are, uh, they are the viruses of bacteria. And we know a lot about them because there's a lot of research about them. We know that they're very specific, so they can target receptors on the bacterial surface. They can kill multi-drug resistant bacteria. They inject their DNA, creating more of themselves and lice out the bacteria to infect other bacteria. They're safe um, for use and they're evolvable. So we can actually evolve them to overcome resistance should it happen. But we also know that there are some disadvantages to their use. So if we wanna use them for treatment, uh, certain infections, um, they can be highly specific. And so we may require uh, multiple phages to treat you may develop an immune response. But again, um, um, it, it could be dependent on how these phages are given. And bacteria will become resistant, but we could counter that because of the evolvability of the phage. But there are some unknowns and things that we should really understand before we use phage for treatment. And that is how do phage and bacteria actually interact at these treatment sites? Do, we, do they kill bacteria in the blood, for instance? Do they maintain specificity in the gut? Do we see resistance at these sites? And these are very important questions that I'm going to focus mostly on the gut today. Um, but these are important questions that we try to answer using model systems. So we developed model systems in our lab, and we also have other groups that have developed model systems that we can utilize to answer these questions. So our main question was whether we could actually edit the gut of XPEC removing this reservoir to prevent these infections and potentially prevent the spread of antibiotic resistance. And so by understanding this interaction, we of course want to develop better therapies and better preventatives. So a little bit about our previous work. So previously, we were able to show that we could treat a bacteremia using phage. So this is our mouse model where we take our mice and we inject them. This is an IP or intraperitoneal shot of our ST131 clinical isolate. An hour later, we then inject them with our phage. So this is our phage that we use, it's HP3. It was named after where it was isolated from a park, Herman Park. It was a goose duck fecal mixture where that came from. And so we purify these phages and we inject our mice with our, um, our HP3 phage. And after an overnight infection, we then look at the health of the mice, then we euthanize them and we plate their organs for bacteria. And so this is a disease severity index where a zero indicates that the mice were healthy and the four indicates that the mice were either really sick or moribund. And you can see in the mice that were untreated, they, they got really sick or moribund. And those that were treated, you see they did very well. 
when we play organs for bacteria, so this is log CFU per gram of organ tissue, you see about a three to four log reduction in bacterial burden in these major organs. So we were able to um, use phage therapy to reduce disease severity and bacterial burden in ST131 multidrug resistant bacteremia. But what about the gut? So the gut is a very complex place, as you can see by this picture. Um, you can imagine a little phage trying to find its host among all this microbiota. Um, it sounds very difficult, but we wanted to try. So for this, we actually gavaged our mice, so we gave them an oral dose of our E. coli. We can follow it over the course of a week, and we gave a group of mice our phage HP3 again, either a daily gavage or in the water. We also had a group of mice that received an antibiotic in the water. And you can see that throughout the infection, and this is in log CFU per gram of fecal pellets, that we can maintain pretty stable levels of XPEC. But in the mice that receive phage, either via gavage in the red or in the water uh, gray, you can see there was no significant difference between the groups. And the group that received antibiotics, you see a precipitous drop in bacteria present, in colonized bacteria. So and then no detectable CFUs throughout. At the end of the experiment, when we plate the small intestine and the large intestine for phage, we see that phage are present in these groups. And when we plate for bacteria, again, we see no significant difference between the groups. Whereas the group that received the antibiotic, you see no detectable CFUs. So in this case, the antibiotic worked, but the phage did not. And so the GI, we believe, is a prohibitive environment for phage infection, but we wanted to figure out what was inhibiting infection. So in order to determine that, we took this out of the mouse into a more manipulatable system. So this is an ex vivo assay. So in this experiment, we take mice that are uninfected, we euthanize them, and we remove the large intestine. So the cecum is the largest part of the large intestine in mice, and we take the contents and we use that as growth media. So that's incubated with uh, saline. We then lightly centrifuge it and we take that supernatant and we use that to uh, as growth media with our phage and with our bacteria. So we do an MOI of 10, so there's 10 times more phage than bacteria for four and a half hours. And then we selectively plate for our bacteria and we plaque for our phage. So this is bacterial levels after four and a half hours, and you can see in this rich growth media, this is LB, that the phage kill. When we take fecal pellets from the cage, and we also do what we did with fecal, we homogenize them and use them as growth media, we see that the phage kill. And when we take our fecal media though, you see no significant difference between the groups. And when we look at phage, we see significantly less phage in our sequel media. So this told us that the phage are not growing and they're not killing bacteria. So there are factors present in the large intestine that may be inhibiting phage. So we took this through a stepwise process in order to determine what these factors were. We filtered our sequel media and the phage killed. So 0.22 micron filter. We boiled our sequel media and the phage killed. We added a cocktail of antibiotics and the phage did not kill. So this told us that this is likely a very large protein in the large intestine. And so we turned to some of the largest proteins in the large intestine, the mucins that make up your mucus layer. So this is what a mucin looks like. <laughs> this is my, uh, my representation of gel forming mucin. It's a bottle brush, um, but gel forming mucins look like two bottle brushes put together where the bristles are the glycosylated regions and the handles are the non-glycosylated regions. And within these non-glycosylated regions, these mucins come together through disulfide bonds to form these really big polymers. And that's what makes up your mucus layer. So bacteria have actually been shown to bind to mucus and it's a way that they colonize. And phage too have been shown to bind to mucus. But what's not known is whether this mucus or the mucins that make up the mucus are actually inhibiting infection. 
So in order to determine that, we decided to figure that out using our system. So we took our sequel media and we spun it down at a high speed to pellet these large proteins. And we call this our insoluble media. So we resuspended that and used that as growth media. We then took our supernatant and also used that as growth media. And you can see here in LB, the phage killed, and sequel, non-significant killing, and soluble media, some killing. But in our soluble media, you can see that the phage really starts to kill. And when we add N-acetylcysteine, which cleaves disulfide bonds, you can see that in, um, in our insoluble medium, the phage start to kill better. And when we add mucin to our soluble media, you can see the inhibition again. So this told us that mucin may actually be inhibiting phage infection, which is something important we should consider if we're gonna be using phage in the gut. But we wanted to see if this was true across the board for all phages. So we can't really test all phages, but we tried to find as many phages as we could in our library that could infect this bacteria. And we tested it in LB plus 1.5% mucin. And you can see that there is only one phage that could kill at all under these conditions. So this is the four and a half hour assay again. If you look at this in LB, so this is without mucin, you can see that many of the bacteria could kill. And ES17, which is the name of the phage that could kill, um, was the one that really didn't kill as good as the other phages. You know? So we wanted to figure out what this mechanism was. So in order to figure out how ES17 is killing with mucin present, we performed an absorption assay. So absorption, in case you don't know, is when phage bind to the bacteria and they inject their DNA. And we can measure this by incubating bacteria and phage together. Then over the course of 10 minutes, we take samples, we spin them down, and we plate the supernatant. So that's free phage. And over the course of the experiment, free phage should go down as absorption rate increases. But we modified this a bit. We actually incubated our E. coli with mucin. We uh, incubated this for five minutes. Then we spun this down and we removed and washed any excess mucin. So essentially only the bacteria that were coated with mucin were present during the experiment. And this is a TEM image of what it looks like with our E. coli and the mucin. And this is our ES17 phage, and you can see it's an unusual looking phage. It's a potovirus, and it has this elongated capsid. So it looks a lot different from our HP3 phage. And when you look at absorption, you can see that without mucin, there's absolutely no absorption. But as you add mucin, you see this precipitous drop in phage remaining, meaning absorption goes up. And you can see the numbers go from uh, zero to 98% absorbed within 10 minutes. If you look at HP3 though, you see the opposite effect. As we add mucin, you see that absorption rate decreases from 98 to 70%. We've also found that ES17 can actually bind mucin. So we coated some uh, ELISA plates with mucin and we saw it could bind it significantly better than HP3. So we hypothesize that this phage is actually utilizing mucin as a receptor to bind and infect bacteria. So this is an unusual concept. You know, how could a phage be utilizing a human sugar as a receptor for a bacteria? Well, probably because of something called capsule. So a capsule is this polysaccharide layer that surrounds bacteria. It protects it from the environment. It also protects it against phage. Phage, though, being the cool co-evolvers, have evolved to bind to capsule, utilizing it as a receptor sometimes. And they can also degrade capsule. And what we found is that our phage ES17 is actually a really good biofilm killer. So generally, phages that can kill in these biofilm assays they can bind and sometimes degrade capsule. So going back to this concept of capsule and this idea called molecular mimicry. So this is a really cool thing that bacteria do. 
So they can actually make their sugars look like the sugars that are in us. And it's a way of avoiding immune system, the immune system. So they can colonize us and infect us. And um, XPEC have this capsule called K5. And it's actually called heparosin because it's very similar, almost identical to heparin sulfate. So heparin sulfates are sugars that are everywhere. They're on the surface of almost all of our cells. They make up the basement membrane of our cells. They are a part of the heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And why am I talking about heparin sulfate? Well, because of some work done by Dr. Justin Clark in our group, and he found that the tail fiber of ES17 is very similar to the tail spike on K5-H. So you can imagine what K5-H binds, it binds K5 capsule. And so actually in the region where it binds, it's highly similar to a region in our tail, or in our tail fiber on ES17. You can see this yellow region are where the residues are identical. So we thought that our phage could bind capsule and could also bind heparin sulfate. So heparin sulfates are not um, mucins, but there are mucins that have similar sugars to heparin sulfate, and heparin sulfates are present in our mucus layer. But we wanted to see if this was true. So we cloned our tail fiber protein and we purified it and we performed a glycan array. So this was done at Emory University. So what they do is they take glycans from synthetic or natural sources, they bind them on this microarray chip, um, they add your protein, and they can detect binding by using antibodies that are fluorescently conjugated that can bind your protein. So the output is relative fluorescent units. And they tested about 860 glycans, and you can see that only those that were specific for heparin sulfate did we see any signal. So this told us that ES17, its tail fiber, was binding heparin sulfate. But what does that mean for the gut? Can ES17 actually bind this sugar in the gut? So in order to determine that, we took this to another really cool model system. So this is human intestinal enteroids. So we have a another service center here that provides us with enteroids and they are derived from colonic biopsies. So patients that get colonic biopsies, we can actually take the crypts from their colon and the stem cells, we add growth factors and they create these really cool 3D organoids and we can form them into monolayers. So these monolayers allows, allow us to easily manipulate them, infect them. And this is a, a cool IF image of what our monolayers look like. And so these are multicellular cell culture models. So what I did is I added my phage to these monolayers. So this is a 10 to the 8th PFP per mil for an hour. I washed and then I fixed them. And so I have antibodies that are specific for the phage. And I use those antibodies to detect it. So this is our monolayer without phage. You can see the blue are the nuclei and the red is MUC2. So MUC2 is one of the major mucins in the gut. But when we add phage in the green, you can see that it's just everywhere on these enteroids. So ES17 seems to bind these human intestinal enteroids really well, including in the region where MUC2 is present. Whereas HP3, you can see, is, is barely detectable on these enteroids. So this told us that ES17 is binding human intestinal enteroids. So is this binding actually dependent on heparin sulfate? To determine that, we added an enzyme, heparin sulfatase 3, that cleaves heparin sulfate in the region where we think uh, ES17 is binding. And then we added our phage. And you can see in our enteroids, again, this is just with the phage that it's just everywhere in the green. But when we add our enzyme, you can see that there's not a lot of green. So, and we can quantitate this and you can see that when we add our enzyme, there is a significant decrease in phage that are bound um, for ES17. There was a decrease with HB3, but it wasn't to the degree that we saw with ES17, suggesting this is a specific binding event. So ES17 is binding to heparin sulfate on these gut models. 
We've also been able to show that when these phage are bound, they can kill E. coli. So I'm not showing you that, but they can kill when they're bound to these enteroids. But going back to our mouse model system, so we wanted to try our new ES17 heparin sulfate mucin loving phage in our mouse model system. So what we did is again, we took our mice and we gavaged them with our E. coli. We then had a group that received HP3 again. We had a group that received ES17. And then we had a group that received both phages. And this is at the end of the experiment when they plate the small intestine and the large intestine. And you can see this time actually we added 10 times as much phage as our last experiment. So we were trying to see if we could, if we add more phage, would the, all of our phages start to work again? And so you can see with more phage, 10 times as much phage, there's a lot of phage in the gut. And in bacterial levels, you can see that HP3 starts to kill much better when we add 10 times as much phage um, in the small intestine. But in the large intestine, we can see that there are still some mice that have bacteria in their gut. However, you look at ES17, you can see it was just as effective in the small intestine as it was in the large intestine, there was really only one mouse that had bacteria in its gut. And when you add both together, we actually still saw that there were some mice that were colonized in the small and the large intestine. So our ES17 could kill in the small and the large intestine, and we think that it's doing this because it can actually utilize mucus or mucin, mucins to kill in the thick mucus layer of the colon. So in summary, I've shown you that I can use these cool model systems um, to actually test that I can edit the gut of XPEC, potentially removing this reservoir, but we've run across some potential um, uh, barriers to phage infection in the gut. One major barrier is mucus, and it's probably something to consider if we're gonna treat the gut. So mucus is inhibiting a lot of phages, but also we can use these cool phages that can utilize mucins or heparin sulfates on these coated bacteria to kill them. So, and potentially we can actually treat these infections, remove this reservoir and prevent the spread of resistance. So that's my research. I'm gonna go directly into the Taylor stuff if that's okay. So Taylor, yeah. <laughs> so Taylor is our service center. Uh, we developed it here at Baylor College of Medicine because we felt there was a need in the community. We are made up of students, um, postdocs, clinicians, and um, and PhDs, and we are located in the Texas Medical Center. So in case you don't know. This is the largest medical center in the world. And I gotta tell you, I haven't been around for a lot of the clinical stuff. So if you have questions regarding that, I can direct those questions, but just a quick overview of what we do. So typically a clinician will come to us because they have a patient um, and they know of us through word of mouth. So they have a patient that has an infection that they believe can no longer be treated the way that they're treating. So their antibiotics aren't working. Um, so they come to us and we consult with them and we decide whether the patient may be a good candidate for phage therapy. <clears throat> and so after we decide that they're a good candidate, then we ask that the clinician send us a sample. And so we get a clinical sample. Uh, we either get a specimen or we get it isolated on a plate, but either way, we always verify that the bacteria is the bacteria that they're saying it is. Then we grow up the bacteria and we use our phage library that we've developed either through research or via, you know, all the other clinical um, cases that we've worked to see if we can find phages that can kill the bacteria. So typically we isolate about four to five cage, uh, different phages. We grow them up, we purify them, um, we remove endotoxin, and we send them out to sterility testing, and then we send them out to the clinician. And the clinician, um, so we don't treat patients, the clinician does, we just kind of give them the tools that they need in order to, to treat them well. 
But if we don't have a phage in our library that kills the bacteria, we have to go out into different um, sources to go phage hunting. So we're very grateful in that we have access to every single sewage plant in the Houston area due to other research we've been doing with COVID-19. So this gives us um, unlimited uh, phages really. So we haven't, you know, we've always been able to find a phage for the infection. But if we have to do that, then we have to characterize it and we can do this in house. We sequence the phage, we annotate it and decide if it, if it has, um, if it doesn't have uh, any undesirable qualities, it's not lysogenic, it um, doesn't have antibiotic resistance cassettes, then it's, it's good for, for phage therapy. And we do other things too. Um, so typically these patients, they're on antibiotics already and they want to continue being on antibiotics. And I think the FDA wants us to continue to have them on antibiotics. So we do something called sonography. So this is to see if the antibiotics that they're on actually synergize with our phage cocktail. And so we kind of um, determine that and we give, again, that information to the clinician and then the clinician decides what the treatment plan is gonna be. So these are the cases that Austin, so Austin is our um, director of operations and he has been handling these cases and I'm just kind of coming back to it. Um, and you can see that they are all different types of bacteria, um, different types of infections, uh, different ages. Um, these are the, the ones that receive phage so far. And I can tell you that the ones that receive phage, they are doing well. Many of them have um, cleared the original infection um, and uh, there have been no side effects. And actually this one right here, we actually used ES17 on that patient. And that's one of, one of our success stories. So I just wanted to tell you about this just to introduce you. And um, of course, hoping that you will tell people about us or clinicians or anybody. So in case that there's a patient that needs us. And so you can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter. You can email us if um, you have any further questions. Here's my acknowledgments of our wonderful lab, our phage team, um, all the money that goes into this. So we provide phage uh, for free for patients for compassionate use. And, um, and then um, the VA is where I do research and Baylor College of Medicine too. And again, here are our contacts. So that's my talk. Thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. I'm clapping. People can unmute and clap or just invisible clap or inaudible clap. Do you want me hey. to stop screen share or continue screen share? Uh, okay, let's ask if we have any questions that pertain yeah. to um, any slides that can go first. You can just unmute yourself. Anyone have a slide relevant question? We can always put them back up. So let's just I have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, hi, Francine. Great talk. Um, so you showed that when you added both phage, um, that there seemed to be less killing of the ES-17 than when it was alone. Yeah. Do you think that the other phage is somehow adding as a protective agent because it's infecting bacteria so the other one can't? Yeah, we think it's a competitive inhibition. Um, and so that's something all else we're considering for our clinical cases. And we've started to actually test our cocktails together to make sure that they're not actually um, inhibiting each other in any way. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, I get that question a lot. <laughs> it really is going to take a lot more experiments to figure out what's really going on, but that, that's what I think is going on. Hey Sabrina, it's Ben Burrows. I've got a question for you. Sure. Um, I was curious, so uh, you showed that ES17 is binding mucin and you are hypothesizing that mucin and capsule are very similar. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you have or, or you're considering getting any evidence, because usually when phages bind the capsule, they degrade it enzymatically in order to actually access the cell membrane yeah. and therefore get their, their DNA in. 
Mm. Um, do you think there is perhaps an enzymatic action going on in these the phage tail fibers to to break down the mucin and, and, and therefore access the, the membrane? Because uh, the reason I ask is it would seem if it just binds it and doesn't do anything, then there's a whole ton of mucin that's, that's going to bind the ES17 and that ES17 is just now stuck down to mucin. Yeah, um, so yeah, you're right. So the capsule, um, you know, people, uh, the phages actually tend to degrade capsule to get to the cell membrane. Um, I've tried to incubate, so, you know, we have this protein and I've tried to incubate this protein with mucin to see if it actually degrades mucin. And I have not been able to show that yet. Um, so I'm not sure if it degrades mucin. And I, I also have not shown <laughs> if it degrades capsule. Um, we do see that on the plate, uh, these uh, ES17 does create the halos around the plaque. So that's mm -hmm. usually indicative that it has these capsule degrading enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible that it is degrading capsule, but I'm not sure that it's degrading mucin is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Anyone else have a question? I'm going to start looking through the chat, but feel free to ask it if you would like. Um, maybe Ben, you had a question in the chat, but maybe it is the same as you just asked. Yes, it's the same okay. question. Actually, I do have another very quick question. The okay. that EN you had of ES17, it was an incredible looking phage. Yeah. Actually, Mark Van Reich and I was were were just chatting between ourselves. It looked just, and this is just a point of interest. It looked like perhaps at the tips of the tail fibers, there there was a globular domain on yeah. that on the EMs. Did yeah. you see that too? Yeah, they look um, they look like paddles to me, but yeah, yeah <laughs> I guess beautiful. that's more the more the scientific way of it describing it. But yeah, they look they are unusual looking. Um, yeah, it's a big phage. yeah, I have a question about that phage. Um, you said it was one of the ones you used in a patient. Is that what I heard? True. Yes. Which or what was going on with that patient? Or it was a patient with a, a UTI and a bladder infection, a recurrent bladder infection. And um, so we use a cocktail of phages. ES17 wasn't the only phage. And the patient did well. Um, so they cleared the original infection. And um, uh, I think Austin just told me that they did develop a different infection, um, but apparently this infection isn't symptomatic. So the original UTI, you know, UTIs can be incredibly painful and terrible and you can imagine being a chronic patient just always having that pain and now this patient still has a bacteria but it seems to be uh, asymptomatic so it's a really interesting case and um yeah i think they're going to write up a paper on it i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah um how does it typically work for your cases uh after they're done like are you is the goal to write them all up separately kind of as case studies or, or a series or? We're still trying to figure that out. I think the case studies will, will be led by the clinician probably, but you know, we can write a lot of it too. Um, so we're hoping, you know, case studies are good because we're gonna learn more from that and we can publish those findings and other people will learn. And then hopefully we can build really cool clinical trials um, that utilize all that um, interesting research. So uh, we are we are trying to to get those published. Yeah, awesome. Who else has a question? I want. I've got more. I could keep going. <laughs> I had a question. You can ask one. Hey, Sabrina, great talk. Um, so I, I was thinking, uh, given that this phage was binding to a few other like you showed a screen where it was binding to a few candidates which had the heparin sulfate, right? So I was wondering, is the binding happening based on like more of a molecular specificity or just like the physical uh, arrangement of the sugars itself? Like is, is the specificity more of a molecular determined or just structurally determined? I think it's molecularly. And I think it's because um, this has been... Um, 
better determined using the, the K5 phage. So the K5 phage actually um, is, uh, they, we know specifically where it binds on hep. So it does bind capsule. It also has been shown in papers to bind heparin sulfate at specific sites. Mm -hmm. And um, and it can it it has been shown too under in vitro conditions to degrade heparin sulfate, um, but we do think that this is a, a molecular interaction, um, like like K five phage. Cool, thanks. Did I hear another voice piping up when Rohit started talking? Yeah, you heard me, but I have the same <laughs> question. Oh, well, I had that question. And another question. Hi, Sabrina. Congrats Hi. on the bending. Thank you. Um, yeah, the question. The other question was more about um, diversity of capsule. If you know on these strains, how diverse they are, and how uh, diverse any type of polysaccharides found in gut in human gut. If, do you know if that is diverse as well? So I can tell you that, you know, the, the E. coli that I study, they're clonal, um, they're a clonal group. So they tend to have the same capsule genes and the, they're probably making the same capsule. Um, I don't know about the rest of the bacteria in the gut, but I imagine they have different types of capsule. But that way we can, yeah, we can, these phage are actually really specific for this x strain. You know, I've tried to, to use ES17 uh, to infect other like bacteria like K12 and things like that. And uh, this is for genetic manipulation. So it's made <laughs> genetic manipulation very difficult. So they're, they're very specific for these ST131 isolates. Uh, we have a related question to that in the chat. Um, how variable are mucin sugars in humans? <laughs> yeah, so the, the world of mucin research is incredibly complex, and I've only touched on it, and I, I really cannot. <laughs> it's like, you know, all this uh, glycan research is starting to come, you know, back, and it's, it's just incredibly complex and interesting. And I couldn't tell you, <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question. It's just, there are so many different types of mucins and people are starting to even discover even more different types of mucins. And um, yeah, but I know that in the gut, the major mucin is MUC2. So um, MUC2, the one that I had a, a in red and the enteroids is, is a major mucin in the gut. Awesome. And here's another question. Um, was the structure the whole protein or was there an end terminal part not in the crystal that would form the stick end of the paddle? Sorry, couldn't ask by voice because there are people sleeping here. Oh, Mark Van Raj. Yes, thank you for that question. Wow. Yeah. So that's like another thing that I'm not an expert in, <laughs> but I can tell you that I cloned the whole protein. So that's, that's the whole protein. Um, the crystallization is still being worked out, so we we haven't crystallized it. That is a um, a prediction. So we haven't crystallized the protein. Maybe Mark wants to crystallize it for you. <laughs> Not <Hey>. if, yes. <laughs> if you want to. Or you're already working you know. on it. <laughs> well, you know, we tried. So it's um, you know we thought we got crystals, but they weren't. You know, but. We may try again. Cool, awesome. All right. I have one more question. If go for it. So um, I I heard honestly I heard the term gavage for the first time today. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering is is it a way like um, that is used in the field to limit the bacteria to the uh, gut itself and like. Uh, in your experiments, did you by any chance like test any of the other organs if? They had any bacteria or if the phages that were given through the gut had any effect on bacterial counts and any of the other organs? So gavage, um, just to be clear, it's like it's like a tube that goes into the mouth. Um, it goes like right into their stomach 
And um, you can put, you can do this with the mouse because they don't have a gag reflex. So it's like a way of directly depositing your bacteria in your phage. Um, and then your question is whether other phages in the gut may be inhibiting the phage. Is that your question? No, I, I was thinking of like, does it limit it to that organ? To oh, gut, does it stay? So yeah, so yeah. that, like I said, it directly deposits it, deposits it in the stomach. So it probably stays in that organ. Um, there have been some studies to show that sometimes phage can translocate. So they can go into the blood sometimes. We, we haven't tested that though. There's a couple questions from Catherine. Um, really nice work and talk. Question number one, will these findings change how you screen and isolate phages at Taylor Labs? Could start with that one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, especially, so if you think of every mucosal site, they all have mucin, right? That's what protects us from bacteria or supposedly protects us but some bacteria can also eat it, they can colonize in it. So definitely for bladder infections, I can see us using mucin to screen some of our phages. Uh, we haven't gotten any patients that had uh, gut infections yet, but if we have a gut infection, I'm sure we will, we will use this. Good awesome. question. <laughs> and her second question, what methods slash assay conditions do you use um, to screen host ranges for phages in your collection that you use in patients? So it's the, the, the plaque assay, nothing fancy. <laughs> um, we have uh, our plates and our double auger plaque assay. Yes, awesome. <laughs> Oh, Mark says, yes, we'd definitely be happy to try and crystallize this or just give some advice on which parts to clone to get the best chance of getting good crystals. Yeah. So yay. We're going to be forwarding the chat to, we always do this for the speakers. So if anyone else wants to say anything to Sabrina, even if we run out of time here, because I was going to ask for one last question, um, she'll be able to get those comments. Or happy, nice things about her talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question and, okay. um, and then we'll go to the breakout rooms. So anyone? Do, do, do. Okay, I'm gonna... Um, okay, I'll stop screen sharing. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. And so I'm now stopping the recording. The breakout rooms are not going to be recorded.